what is science? A few years ago, well, maybe more than just a few, when I was at school and university, that question was answered every time you opened a science textbook. The textbooks and the introduction always started off, science is that branch of the search for knowledge which follows the scientific method. Well, that immediately raises the question, what is the scientific method and where does it come from? The scientific method was put forward by a man called Francis Bacon. And he lived at the time of the Reformation. He proposed the scientific method for this reason. Nature carries the stamp of the creator, whereas man's reason carries the stamp of his own folly. We will have it that all things are as we in our folly think they should be. And to get over this propensity of man to believe what he thinks is true, he proposed the scientific method. In the scientific method, the search for knowledge about any phenomenon or process involves one, observation and measurements. That is the very first thing. Without observations and measurements, no science. Two, the search for patterns in the observations and measurements. And of course, without observations and measurements, you can't search for patterns in them. Three, proposal of a hypothesis to explain these patterns. Four, design of critical experiments to test the hypothesis. It has to be an experiment which could show your hypothesis to be false. It's no good choosing an experiment that will always say yes. Five, if experimental results do not support the hypothesis, then one must search for a hypothesis which explains both the old and the new observations and measurements. Then six, if much experimental evidence supports a hypothesis and none contradicts it, it is considered a law of science. And seven, if any observation contradicts a hypothesis, it must be abandoned and a new hypothesis sought. One can see why the great Russian scientist Mendeleev made the famous statement, science begins with measurement. If there's no measurement, science cannot even make a start. And Albert Einstein made the even more famous statement, what can be measured is science. Everything else is speculation. Now you'll notice that Bacon put forward the reason for the scientific method, for putting forward science, because nature carries the stamp of the creator. This is a purely religious reason. Without a creator, there is no point in doing the scientific method. Science only started when the scientific method was introduced. Many people don't like that idea and they point to the Greeks and say, well, the Greeks were the first people who invented science. Well, they certainly did take observations and measurements. They did put forward hypotheses, but they didn't do experiments for a very good reason. They had a whole pantheon of gods, plenty of them. And their gods meddled in nature. And they, these gods often had petty differences and quarrels between themselves and they used to vie with each other for the affections of beautiful damsels and such things. So there was absolutely no reason to believe that nature would always behave the same way. After all, if the gods are playing around with it, not only will it not behave the same tomorrow as today, but it will be sacrilegious to get mixed up with them. You know, we mustn't, uh, we mustn't interfere with them. So, 
they never did experiments. They did mathematics, the most powerful tool in a scientist's toolbox. They spent a lot of time developing philosophy, logic. But they didn't do science because they didn't do experiments. Pythagoras, for example, did a great deal of work in mathematics. He also put forward hypotheses. For example, he put forward a hypothesis about the notes ringing from hammers of different weights. But he didn't do an experiment to test to see if that hypothesis was correct. It was actually wrong. But he never found out it was wrong. He never did the experiment. Perhaps the greatest philosopher of all time was Aristotle, an amazing man who dealt with every field of human endeavor, art and music and playwriting and literature and science. And in his science, his biology was quite good. But his physics was completely off the mark. It was all wrong. But he never found out it was wrong because he never did any experiments to test it. And in fact, nobody did. Right until the Reformation, for 2,000 years, Aristotle's physics was accepted, taught in all the institutes of learning, and it was all wrong. It was only when Bacon introduced the scientific method at the time of the Reformation that people started doing experiments, tested it, and said, oh, look, people have been leaving, believing this for 2,000 years. It's just not right. And for exactly the same reason, science could not develop in the East. Because the Eastern religions, like Hinduism, they've got more gods than the Greeks had. Many of them, vast numbers of them. To expect that everything would behave in a uniform manner that there would be uniform, universal laws underlying the behavior of nature makes no sense. They made no attempt to start science. Mathematics, yes, just as the um, Greeks did. In the same way, science could not develop in Africa. Because in Africa, nature is controlled by the spirits. And the spirits are conjured by witches and witch doctors. And to expect that things will happen in the next village the same as they happen here, why should it? There are different spirits over there. They're conjured by a different witch doctor. So to expect there would be universal laws of nature that, that would happen that work the same everywhere just wouldn't make any sense. Now, one might expect there's a much better chance that Islam might have produced science. Because, after all, there is only one God, so there you've got a chance of unity in nature. But the trouble is, Allah is, one could say, capricious. He gets involved, and the saying, it is written, it means Allah's just decided that he's written it down and it's going to happen. I used to live in northern Nigeria. Electric University there. And uh, that's a Muslim area of Nigeria. And I had a few Muslim friends, and one uh, asked to go with me one day in my car, and I knew some of his friends were going to the same place, and just for interest, I said, Well, you're very welcome to come, but um, I'm surprised you're not going with your friends. He said, Oh, I know my people. They don't put the brake on, they look to Allah. And another time, driving along, a chicken ran across the road just as the car was driving through and the chicken got run over. This Muslim in the passenger seat said, isn't it amazing that Allah should decree that that chicken should cross the road just at that moment? You see, whether you have a crash or whether that chicken gets killed doesn't depend on how safe you drive. It, whether it is, depends on whether Allah has decided you're in for a crash. So with that kind of attitude, there's no point in doing science as well. Now, the Muslim also 
developed mathematics? But science, no. There has, in fact, only ever been one worldview which made the development of science possible. And that's the Judeo-Christian worldview. And science did not develop anywhere else in the world, among any other people, than the Christians of the Reformation. Because the Bible tells of one God who created everything. It's a law-giving God. One would expect nature to carry the stamp of his laws. And that was the reason why Johannes Kepler was prepared to spend years of his life poring over the observations and measurements that Tycho Brahe had made of the sun, moon and planets. He was prepared to put in years of effort to find patterns in those measurements because he was confident the patterns would exist. He was confident that the creator who made it, who made the sun, the moon and the planets, did things in an orderly way. And if he searched hard enough, he would be able to find it. And after many years of very laborious calculation, they didn't have calculators in those days or computers. Everything had to be done with pen and ink. Eventually, he found the pattern in those measurements and deduced that the planets orbit the sun in an elliptical orbit with the sun at the one focus. And when he discovered it, he rejoiced and said, isn't God wonderful to have made such an amazing plan? And uh, he's famous for his statement, the privilege of a scientist is to think God's thoughts after him. Isaac Newton, in the same mold, a scientist strictly, eagerly observing the creation very diligently, very carefully, he brought a new standard of accuracy to measurements in science. Standards that he worked to were one of the reasons he was able to find out so much and make such huge progress in science. But Newton spent more time doing research in the scriptures than he did doing research in mathematics. Newton wrote far more about the scriptures than he wrote about science. Leonard Euler, today he would probably be considered the greatest scientist that ever lived because today scientists are judged on the number of papers they publish. And he published more papers than anybody else by far. For 50 years, one third of all the papers on mechanics, on engineering mechanics, mathematics, and theoretical physics. It was all done by Euler. Very interesting man. He attended Bible uh, study every day of his life, even when he was in his cradle. His father took the Bible studies when he was a child, when he got married and left home. He took the Bible studies. When his children grew up, they used to come to his house in the evenings for Bible study. When he grew old, he went blind. He still carried on with his Bible studies because he had the Bible entirely in his head. He developed Newton's work. He took it further until it could, um, in, until it could deal with just about any problem in mechanics. He developed fluid mechanics, aerodynamics, he developed the mathematics that just about all scientists use today, particularly partial differential equations. Then we have James Clerk Maxwell, who made enormous advances in electricity and magnetism. He discovered radiation, radio waves, microwaves, everything to do with that kind of thing. He said he came across his insights into his field theories by considering the way God shows himself to work in the Bible. 
there is long-standing benefits that have come from these people's work. Newton, for example, in his work in optics, he soon showed that it would be impossible to use lenses to make big telescopes. And he showed that the only way to go was to make telescopes using mirrors. And he made this first reflecting telescope himself. Today, all the, all the big telescopes are reflecting telescopes. The Hubble telescope, for example, interesting that this feat of modern technology, the science, is from those early days. The, the design, you, the mechanics getting it into orbit, Newton's work as developed and refined by Euler, the control of this thing using the work of Maxwell. Just about everything we look at today in communications and transport, we look at a plane like this, who developed aerodynamics? The art Euler. These are controlled by radio and radar control and all th things like that. It comes from Maxwell. The dynamics of getting the thing moving. <laughs> Newton and Euler. Science very soon proved itself to be a field which works. And so people started coming into science who didn't have the worldview which made science possible. I'm sure you'll recognize our good friend Julian Huxley, a typical secular humanist who flooded into science seeing that it worked. But with their worldview, they had absolutely no reason to believe whatsoever that science would work. After all, the secular humanist, an atheist, has to believe everything just happens by chance. There's no design there, because there's no designer. And on such a worldview, to expect there to be universal laws, where on earth would such an idea come from? But having seen science does work, they moved into it, and they took great pains to take over in science. Now, at around about the time when Huxley was starting to make himself a power in science, Henry Dale got a Nobel Prize for a work which revolutionized the study of the ner nervous system. And he clearly could see there's something wrong here. And he made a, a very interesting statement concerning science, which I'd like you to consider uh, carefully. And science, we should insist, better than any other discipline, can hold up to its students and followers an ideal of patient devotion to the search for objective truth, with vision unclouded by personal or political motive, not tolerating any lapse from precision or neglect of any anomaly, fearing only prejudice and preconception, accepting nature's answers humbly and with courage, and giving them to the world with an unflinching fidelity. The world cannot afford to lose such a contribution to the moral framework of its civilization. Now you can see he's talking about a search for objective truth. The truth about the creator's creation. What's not acceptable is, is political and personal motives. That's out. We're looking just for the truth. And this is important. The world cannot afford to lose such a contribution to its moral framework. Now, you can see in that a concern. And he is concerned because he can see what's happening. He can see people like Julian Huxley moving in with a completely different agenda. And we find science dominated by people not like Henry Dale, but like this chap. He's a fairly typical, prestigious modern scientist. He holds a very prestigious position. He has the Alexander Agassiz Research Professorship at a very prestigious university at Harvard. 
Richard Lewontin is a fairly typical example of a very high profile scientist of today. And he has made statements about science too. Let's compare what he says with what we've just read from Dale. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It's not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is an absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Is he talking about the same discipline that Henry Dale was talking about? Is there any mention of a search for objective truth? There's a mention of patent absurdity and scientific uh, just-so stories. But it looks as if the main aim of this is keeping the divine foot out of the door, whatever the cost. It looks as if he's talking about something completely different. I had a very uneasy feeling about what, what is really wrong in science. And my eyes were opened in 1994 when I was giving a series of lectures in Heidelberg in Germany. To one of my lectures, there was a physicist from the Max Planck Institute. And when he came to the question time afterwards, he shocked me. He said, but you're talking about the scientific method. Nobody does that anymore. Now, I had known for a long time that there were vast numbers of scientists who were not using the scientific method. But what amazed me was to find a professional scientist admitting it. This opened my eyes and thought, aha, now that's the big problem with science. It's not science anymore. So I started looking at some recent textbooks to see what they have to say about science. And I found a very woolly introduction. Typically, it would say, it's not easy to define science. And he waffles on a little bit, and then he says, science is what scientists do. I thought, is that a definition of science? After all, scientists go to the toilet. Is that science? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I didn't come across a satisfying definition being used today until I came across Professor Brian G. Wallace, who is a professor of physics at the University in Florida, in America. He wrote a book. It's called The Farce of Physics. You can get it on the internet. It's worth reading. Very worth reading. And he comes across this same problem. How do you define science these days? And he pointed to Thomas Kuhn, who is one of the most famous philosophers of science, very well respected. And he pointed out that he effectively defines science this way. A proposition is scientific if it is sanctioned by the scientific establishment. Well, how do the scientific establishment sanction ideas? They uh, sanction them by allowing them to be published in respected journals of science. Now, they determine which are respected, 
which can count as science, and the top, the number one, is a journal called Nature. And very close behind it, right on its heels, is another publication called Science. These two are the top. But there are plenty of others. There are lots more. The distinguishing feature about all these journals of science is they are sanctioned by the scientific establishment. And anything that appears in here is science. Anybody who publishes in here are scientists, and those who don't are not. Now, there are other journals, like, for example, Galilean Electrodynamics and CRSQ, but they are not accepted as science. Because to the scientific establishment, certain things are sacrosanct, they cannot be criticized, and certain things are banned, they cannot be mentioned. And to the scientific establishment, these points are absolutely vital. They are sacrosanct. Evolution. You may not cast the slightest doubt on evolution. Billions of years. You may not cast the slightest doubt on billions of years. Naturalistic cosmology, particularly the Big Bang. You can say as much as you like that about, about that as you like. You can even mention things like steady state cosmology or even plasma cosmology. But beyond that, no chance. The Copernican principle, that is the idea that the Earth is nothing special. It's also called the mediocrity principle. The Earth is just a second-rate planet moving around a second-rate sun, moving around a second-rate galaxy, moving around a second-rate group of galaxies. It's nothing special. And Einstein's relativity. Now that is actually linked with that. So the banned items are the things which go against these. Intelligent design and creation, you can mention them only to pour scorn on them. Short time scale, again, you can mention it only to pour scorn on it. You're not allowed to put forward any of the evidence which makes many people believe. Alternatives to naturalistic cosmology, definitely not allowed. And geocentricity, the opposite of Copernican principle, no, that is taboo. Now, one would think, but why is this taboo? The problem is, all the experiments attempting to prove the Copernican principle have all instead pointed to geocentricity. They've all pointed to the fact that the Earth is the center of the creation. And the only way all that evidence can be disregarded is by Einstein's relativity. Einstein's relativity was only invented to explain away all the evidence for this. So it's absolutely sacrosanct. So these points here, you must support them you must go against these, otherwise you're not going to get anything published in the journals of science and you will not be considered a scientist. And if anybody attempts to go against the wishes of the scientific establishment, there are sanctions that dissenters can be hit with. First, they can be fired from their jobs. This is usually only for pretty junior scientists, people who are just trying to establish themselves. If it gets to be known that they believe in any of the banned subjects, if they give a lecture on it, if they write a book on it or anything like that, they will be immediately fired from their jobs. They'll have qualifications and all. One can spend, say, five years doing research for a PhD <coughs> at university. And then it's found that you don't believe in evolution. 
and that university can simply cancel your degree and you find that the piece of paper you've got is not a valid degree certificate, it's been cancelled. Now when he gets to more senior people, it's not quite so easy to do that. So what happens to more senior people is they are denied publication in approved journals. And if you can't publish your work, then you can't make any advance in science. You are denied research grants. Now without a research grant, you can't do any research, so you can't do any science. And for the very top, you are denied Nobel Prizes. Well, the first person that I've come across that bumped up against the sanctions of the establishment scientists was Professor Herbert Dingle, a very famous professor of physics, an expert on relativity. He'd written books on relativity when he came across a very simple very elegant and totally irrefutable proof that relativity is wrong. It's just plain false. And to his surprise, the scientific journals would not publish his proof that relativity is wrong. And he was very upset. He, uh, he said, but look, this information is being deliberately suppressed. Science can't work this way. And he wrote a book, Science at the Crossroads, in which he not only put forward his disproof of relativity, but he put forward his concern about the fact that science was being run in such a way that important information could be suppressed. Quite recently, a film, Expelled, has been made. You might have seen it. It was on the show in cinemas in South Africa about a year ago, and you can get the DVD at the DVD shops, by Ben Stein, and this DVD is showing people being thrown out of science, people being persecuted for not towing the line, not doing what the scientific establishment tells them to do. Now this is mainly about juniors, people who have been thrown out and people whose qualifications have been rescinded and things like that. But the higher level people, like for example Robert Gentry, a world expert on a field of radiometric dating called radio halos. And I don't think there's anybody in the world who knows more about radio halos than he does. And when his work started to show that the Earth is probably not millions of years old, but it formed very quickly indeed. And when his work showed that things like coal seams are not millions of years old, but just a few thousand years, then he became persona non grata. He was thrown out of his job. He can't get anything published in the respected journals of science, that is. One of the reasons was because he published this book, Creation's Tiny Mystery, which gives lots of evidence that in fact the Earth was created very quickly. Then there's this man, a very senior scientist, he's called Halton Arp, and he used to be classified as being one of the top 20 astronomers in the world. But his work started to show that the expanding universe story isn't valid and the Big Bang isn't true. So all his research grants were cut off. He was banned from the telescopes. An astronomer who cannot get onto a telescope can't do any research. He can't be an astronomer if he can't get on a telescope. So, his only alternative, his only option was to retire. And he wrote this book, Seeing Red, Redshift Cosmology in the Academics and Academic Science, in which he not only talks about the research which they would not publish and threw him out for, but the shenanigans and the scientific establishment as well. You may recognize this chap when I was a student. He was my hero. 
a very great scientist, Fred Hoyle, he did work which was so fundamental, so striking that it had to get a Nobel Prize. But Hoyle started making noises and he showed that the idea of evolution was a fairy story. He pointed out it's just not possible. He pointed out that the materialistic cosmologies don't work either. He made statements like the creation of the universe, like the solution of the Rubik Cube, demands an intelligence. Now, that doesn't go down well with the scientific establishment. They stopped publishing his papers. He was cut off from his work. To get anything published, he had to publish it himself. For example, this book, A New View of Creation and Evolution, but that's not allowed. You're not allowed a new view of creation and evolution. You have to have the scientific establishment's view. Otherwise, you're thrown out. Now, his work demanded a Nobel Prize, but they couldn't give it to Hoyle because, well, he's now out of it. So they gave it to one of his minor collaborators, a man called William Fowler, and he was amazed. Even in his speech of acceptance, he said, well, this ought to really go to Fred Hoyle. But he couldn't, you see, because he blotted his copybook by going against the scientific establishment. If you stick within the requirements of the scientific establishment, you can become very famous. Like these two people, Joseph Affili and Richard Keating, very famous. They published a paper in the journal Science in 1972. Now that's one of the top two journals. So this is real science. Now what they did was they carried atomic clocks in airliners around the world. And they wrote it up saying they had proved Einstein's relativity by the behavior of these clocks. And everybody said, wonderful. And science published it, and they became very famous. Here we've got another man. He's called Louis Essen. If you look him up on the internet, you will find him called the Lord of Time. He knows more about time and time measurement than anybody else in the world. He has been director of the British Physics Research Institute, which has a very famous department dealing with time. He invented the atomic clock. He knows more about atomic clocks than anybody else in the world. And when he read Hafili and Keating's paper in science, he immediately realized what they're saying is rubbish. And so he wrote a paper explaining why what they were saying could not be true. And since they had published in Science, he sent it to Science. They refused to publish it. He sent it to all sorts of journals. They refused to publish it. And eventually, Five years later, he sent it to CRSQ, and they did publish it. But you see, that is not a journal recognized by the scientific establishment. So it's not science. But even though it's not science, it is a journal in which one can find very interesting science, but it's not recognized as science by the establishment. Quite a number of people read that. One of the, the people reading it, uh, Dr. Kelly, a physicist, was shocked by this and he got the original data, the measurements that Hafili and Keating took, and he wrote a paper, Hafili and Keating tests, did they prove anything? The abstract says this, the original test results were not published by Hafili and Keating in their famous 1972 paper. They published figures that were radically different from the actual test results, which are here published for the first time. The analysis of the real data 
shows that there's no credence that can be given to the conclusions of Hafili and Keating. Now you can download this paper, also for free, off the internet, but it's not science, because it's not published in one of the journals that the scientific establishment sanctions. So the paper written on this forged data, yes, that's science, the expose to show that it's just not true. No, that's not science at all. None of the scientific journals would publish it. Brian G. Wallace, I mentioned before, in the Farce of Physics, he pointed to Kuhn's definition, and he went a little further. He said, a proposition is scientific if it is sanctioned by the scientific establishment. Example, if the scientific establishment decrees that fairies exist, then this would be scientific <laughs> indeed. Now, does that sound a little extreme? Not at all. Not at all. This is a picture from Carl Sagan's book, Comet. Now, Carl Sagan was a scientist, published in the, the scientific journals. And he's talking here about the Oort cloud or the Oort cometary shell. The solar system is supposed to be surrounded by an enormous shell of comets, thousands of millions of billions of them, which cannot be seen or detected in any way. Now, doesn't that sound just like fairies? Can they be seen or detected in any way? But let's see what Carl Sagan says about these fairies. Many scientific papers are written each year about the Oort cloud, its origin, its properties, its evolution. Yet there is not a shred of observational evidence for its existence. Can there be any measurements on them? Any observations? But they're scientific because they're published in the journals of science. And I want to look here at a paper which was published by three well-known um, astronomers, Denison, Fiedler, and Johnson, in the top journal of science, in nature. Now, they describe a quasar which they could see in their radio telescope. And over a period of about a week, it gradually disappeared, and eventually there was just about nothing left. And then over a week, it started to come back again, and there they had it again. Now, they explained this in terms of what they call an extreme scattering event structure, an ESE structure made up of electrons and neutrons and various hypothetical particles. And they said, well, what happened is this structure moved over the quasar and gradually obscured it and then went out of the way again. Now, this paper was reviewed in astronomy by Herod L. Fuskeer. Let's see what he had to say about this paper. The most intriguing thing about the hypothesized structures, a point the authors of the report hesitated to emphasize but did allude to. They skated over it, but they knew about it all right. These objects are not stable. If such an object could exist for even a moment, it would quickly dissipate. They know that. They did allude to it, but they skated over it. They know perfectly well they're telling you a story. Any such object, if it could be pushed together, would fly apart so quickly it would be gone in no time. And there they are, telling us that this kind of object lasted long enough to explain this phenomenon over two weeks. They know perfectly well what they're telling you is Rubbish. So does Fasquier jump on them and say, well, these people shouldn't be telling us fairy stories in the top journal of science, should they? Well, let's see what he, what he says. 
they could either attempt to explain the radio brightness change and ignore the stability problem, or they could confront the stability issue and be unable to explain the radio variations. In other words, have no paper to write. But the prestige of a scientist today depends on the number of papers he gets published, especially in the top journals. Now, it doesn't matter whether those papers are true. It doesn't matter if they're important. You've just got to get them published in nature. So these people are telling us a fairy story just so they can get another paper behind their name. Well, does the skier come down like a ton of bricks and say, these people should be thrown out? Let's see what he says. Like all good scientists, they're able to tolerate the ambiguities in their model. All the other scientists are doing exactly the same thing. Worthless lies in the journals of science. When I confronted scientists with this, I was amazed at the response. They said, oh, but this paper's five years old. It doesn't matter. You see, today we have throwaway science. After five years, everybody knows it's been disproved or it's useless or it's worthless. It takes five years to disprove something. The work of Newton, Faraday, Joule, Thompson, you know, that's exactly as valid today as it was when they did it. Today, the stuff that's published in the journals, five years, well, forget it. Throw away science. A very famous theologian, Abraham Kuyper, made a prediction quite a number of years ago. He said there will be two different kinds of science. He could see what was happening in science. He said there will be regenerate science and unregenerate science. Nobody refers to regenerate science and unregenerate science. What he meant was regenerate science by people saved by the blood of Jesus, regenerated in the spirit. And science done by unsaved people. And he said, these people will look at what they're doing and say, that's not science. These people will look at what they're doing and say, that's not science. Amazing prediction, and yet, that's pretty well what's happened. There are two very distinct sciences. Nobody calls them regenerate and unregenerate science. Nowadays, it's called creation science and secular science. Creation science is done by people who believe the creation was created by a creator, and the job of science is to find out how his creation works. People like Dale are concerned about a search for truth, the truth of the way the creation works. Any idea can be considered. Until it's been proved wrong, it's worth considering. Anyone is welcome to pursue the quest for knowledge about the creation. And the scientific method is indispensable. Whereas with secular science, there is no search for objective truth. In fact, secular scientists deny that truth exists. They say there's no such thing as truth. They search for useful theories. Only secular ideas can be considered. You may not consider anything which is not secular. There is control, censorship, and regulation. It's a central part of it. And the scientific method is subservient to secular theories. You can use the scientific method as long as it doesn't inter interfere with any of the sanctioned ideas. But as soon as it interferes with the ideas that are sanctioned, it's pushed aside. And the people on the secular uh, science side, they say creation scientists are not scientists at all. They never publish any research in the recognized journals of science. Guess why not? It's not accepted for publication, but this is the 
This is the standard statement of the secular scientist. Creation scientists are not scientists at all. Scientists are people who publish in the accepted journals. Whereas creation scientists look at what's going on in the secular scientific world and they say, well, is that really science? It's just as Abraham Kuyper said. Now, we looked earlier at this brilliant scientist, Leonard Euler, who did an, an amazing amount of original research. More papers published than any other scientist, and it's all fundamental, valuable stuff. And he said, in our researches into the phenomena of the visible world, in other words, in doing science, we are subject to weaknesses and inconsistencies. We make mistakes. So humiliating that a revelation with a capital R, he's talking about the Bible, was absolutely necessary to us, and we ought to avail ourselves of it with the most powerful veneration. The only way we can keep from going off the track in science as well as in anything else is to follow what the Bible says. To Euler, to Newton, to all the early scientists, the Bible was the most important Manhattan book. Newton did more work on the Bible than he did in science. And yet, amazingly, there are even Christians today who are prepared to take, as a higher authority, the journals of science, the pronouncements of the secular scientific establishment. And that is rather surprising in view of what jo Douglas Jones pointed out. The odd thing is that science has such a ridiculous track record to serve as such a powerful veto house of truth. If we think in terms of centuries and millennia, few other disciplines turn inside out so flippantly and quickly as the natural sciences. Nothing can take the puff out of the scientific chest more than a study of its history. Perhaps that's why it's so rare to find science departments requiring courses in the history of science. The history of science provides great strength to the inductive inference that at any point in its history, that day's science will almost certainly be deemed false, if not laughable, within a century often in much less time. Well, we ask the question, what is science? And I don't think that everybody is going to be satisfied with any answer to that question. What will satisfy you depends on the answer you give to that big fundamental question we looked at last time. Why is there something instead of nothing? There are two answers. The creation was created by a creator, or the creation created itself. And as we saw last time, the answer that you accept to that question makes a huge difference on every question and it even makes a huge difference to what you are going to accept as science. If you accept the first possibility, the creation was created by a creator, then you will almost certainly go along with Henry Dale and you will find that science has a commitment to the scientific method. It is a search for objective truth. Even if we never find the truth, it is the search for that objective truth. 
we do not tolerate anomalies because anomalies cannot occur when you're dealing with the truth. We accept nature's answers humbly and with courage even if they're not the answers that we actually hoped for. No political considerations must come into account. They always blur the picture. And the scientific endeavor has a bearing on the moral framework of society. Now, on the other hand, if you accept that the creation created itself, you will have a view probably very much like that of Richard Lewontin, where the real commitment is to materialism, even if that commitment leads to patent absurdity, like, for example, the Big Bang theory. Extravagant promises. There are so many scientists who say science has all the answers and although we haven't got quite all of them yet we will have them unsubstantiated just so stories the theory of evolution is full of them they don't mind that it's counterintuitive one of the science advisors to the United States president once said that one course in relativity makes all straight thinking impossible. That doesn't matter. Relativity is counterintuitive, it doesn't make sense, but if it's needed, it's perfectly acceptable. It doesn't matter if it's mystifying to the uninitiated. Quantum theory is mystifying to the initiated. In fact, I believe it was Niels Bohr who once said, if anyone says they understand quantum theory, they don't know anything about it at all. But the main point, the absolutely central issue which cannot be let go of, you cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Which alternative would you like to choose? Now, I would like to point out that for a Christian, Paul gives a warning. Listen to what he says to his disciple, Timothy. O oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings, and oppositions of science falsely so called which some professing have erred concerning the faith.
if a human being does not feel that they are worth something, like somebody loves them and created them, they will not seek for something more in the universe. So um, I think that's the main aim of all this propaganda. It's to take away people's self-worth so that they do not seek out the one who loves them, the one who created them. I don't see how the scientific method does that. I'm oh, sorry, no scientific method. I meant the scientific, scientific establishment. establishment. I don't know. Well, yes. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, I think in the in the in the minds of the people who are pushing the scientific establishment, they are wanting to justify their worldview. And you cannot allow your you cannot justify your worldview if things like evolution are trashed. Because it's absolutely essential to your worldview. So you can't allow it to be trashed. And if you have that if you have that worldview, then life is meaningless. There is no value. A boy is a pig is a dog. There is no worth if there is no creator. We are just accidents on the life. So if you say the Earth is a lot younger than science says it is, what do you mean by younger? How old? Or? Well, maybe in two weeks' time we'll have a presentation on the evidence for well, the earth really is. It was uh, the question would uh, be around dinosaurs and where, where do they fit in and why are they gone and what happened to them uh, when Adam was created? Well, dinosaurs are a very interesting, uh, a very interesting kind of creature. The story has been popular in science and it's the only one that's allowed in the journals. These things died out 65 million years ago. It's a very nice story, but there have been a number of problems with that. First of all, there are descriptions of dinosaurs in ancient writings. For example, the history of Gen Geoffrey of Monmouth. Now, it's interesting that he is taken as being authoritative. What he writes is taken as being exact history. Except when he talks about dinosaurs. People say, well, here he must be making it up. Because we know dinosaurs weren't around for him to write about. Then there are dinosaurs carved in all sorts of places where they shouldn't be, like on the gates of Babylon, um, Angkor Wat. There are temples even more recent than Angkor Wat, where there are recognized carvings of dinosaurs. And these temples, they, they worshipped the various animals as gods. And among the animals they worshipped, there are these dinosaurs. When Alexander the Great did his conquests, he took a historian with him. Well, there may have been more than one, but he wanted everything recorded. And when he got to India, his historian writes that the Indians were more concerned that his army would kill their enormous gods, which they worship, animals they worshipped as gods. They were more concerned about that than they would overrun the country. Recently, a paleontologist in America, a woman called Mary Schweitzer, discovered that dinosaur remains that she was dealing with had still got flexible blood vessels in them. And those blood vessels still contained recognizable blood cells. Now we know a lot about blood cells. One of the things we know is they don't last millions of years. There have been sections of DNA found from dinosaurs. 
DNA is made up of 100% right-handed sugars. And it produces proteins which are 100% left-handed amino acids. But when something dies, they start to um, become a racemic mixture again. They, some of the left-handed start to switch to right. Some of the right-handed start to switch to left. And observations show that even under the best conditions, in 50,000 years, there would not be enough left to form a recognizable piece of a protein. And yet recognizable pieces of dinosaur protein, um, protein and DNA have been found. Which means there's absolutely no chance they can be 50 million years old. No chance at all. Now, when you consider the fact that people like Jeffrey of Monmouth wrote about dinosaurs, that there are carvings and rock paintings of dinosaurs. There are carved dinosaurs in temples which are not that ancient. The whole story uh, doesn't seem to fit very well with all those millions of years. It doesn't fit at all. But now, when you combine that with the latest research in microbiology, you find that not only dinosaurs don't fit with, it, with millions of years, not no life does. The rate at which DNA is deteriorating is vastly faster than anybody had imagined. Now, when geneticists started looking at, uh, at DNA and, and looking at mutations, they very quickly realized that if mutations occur very quickly, then DNA would become garbled very, very quickly. So they made the statement that mutations are very rare. And they believed that because for millions of years of life, they would have to be very rare. Otherwise, there would be a problem of what they call error catastrophe. Now the recent research shows that at least 300 mutations occur every generation. Now that is disaster in a short order. You cannot have many generations before the DNA becomes so garbled that life is not viable. So you cannot push life very far back because at 300 uh, mutations per generation, you don't have to go very far back before you've got no mutations, you're at perfection. And you can't go very much further before you've got such garbled DNA that it's no good anymore. Now, a few years ago, I was in France uh, giving some lectures. And some research was pointed out to me by a group in France where they had been looking at sterility in men. Now, the reason why they look at uh, male sterility is because it's so much easier to test. It's very difficult in women because they've got a very complicated reproductive system. But men's reproductive system is much simpler and much easier to test. And they found that sterility in men in France is increasing at 1.5% per year. Now, at one and a half percent per year, you can't go on very many years before you've got a sterile population. Well, after France, France, I went to England, and I found those a team had done exactly the same research project in England. They had also found sterilized sterility in men rising at one and a half percent per year. From there, I went to America. And one of the first people I met was a nature conservation officer in the Everglades in Florida. And he was very worried. He said, we have looked for a year 
and we haven't found one male panther that is not sterile. And he said the problem with the Everglades alligators is nearly as bad. We hardly find any male alligators that are, ster that are not sterile. The whole population is going to die out unless something drastic happens. Life is a short-term phenomenon. It cannot last very long. It cannot have been here very long. You can argue that if God meant for us to discover him in a different way than science, maybe he could have hidden himself in science uh, to the point where he created dinosaurs and bones or whatever to lie underground to make it look, although he created it maybe six or seven thousand years ago, he could have created it to make it look as if it was millions of years ago. If he wanted to do that, nothing would have if he wanted to, but why on earth would he want to do that? Maybe he wanted us to discover him in a different way than scientific. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. It doesn't say the just shall live by faith until science proves it makes it. <laughs> no, it says the just shall live by faith. So you will never, ever be able to prove with science or any other way. So what is the point then of disproving science? Well, now, you see, as far as the secular humanist goes, he has to believe in evolution. There is no alternative, because unless there is evolution, the only alternative is creation. But you see, the argument of, of, of the secular uh, population is that uh, although Christians try to disprove evolution, it does not prove God. True, it doesn't. For a Christian, whether evolution is true or not is irrelevant, except that the Bible says God created. Because the Creator, God, could have used any way he wanted. If he wanted to, he could have used evolution. But he gives us his word in which he tells us he created it, he spoke it into being. So, as far as a Christian is concerned, God simply told us how we did it. As far as the person who does not want to believe in God goes, he has to believe it happened over a long period by chance. It has to be a long period because we observe things today and they are, if they change, they change so slowly we can't observe it. Therefore it must have happened over a very, very long time. So a huge time span is absolutely essential for someone who wants to believe in evolution. And if you don't want to believe in a creator, you more or less have to believe in evolution. There's no alternative. So um, I think it's, uh, it's quite easy to see that the secular humanist realizes his position can be disproved. Now, I had a, a very interesting example of this a few years ago in Russia. I was at a university and the, the um, director of this university, he somehow got on quite well with me and he decided that I should give a lecture to every department in the entire university. So I went off to arrange a time and everybody arranged the time for a lecture except the English department. Now the English department said well we don't want a lecture we we want some practice for our final year students. We want you to, to take um, a discussion group discussing South African politics to give our students some practice in speaking English. So I thought, oh, well, that's not what I came for, but if 
that's all I can do, all right. So I came to the English department after I'd been to the history department where I gave a lecture on the disastrous influence on society of evolution theory. And uh, I arrived there and the head of the department said, right, everybody into your discussion groups. And at that moment, the director of the university walked in. And he said, well, English class, you are today fortunate to have one of Professor Stott's world-famous lectures. So I thought, aha, got my projector out. It was on the stand and all ready to set up. And by the time he left, I got the slides from him. Now, that was the only lecture I gave at that university where I did not use an interpreter, because they were English students. I went through this lecture. It was on evolution. And at the end of it, there was dead silence. And the head of the department came to me and said, well, thank you very much for your lecture. And I said, well, it doesn't look as if anybody understood it. And the head of the department said, oh, yes, we understood it. But you see, we are all atheists, and you've just destroyed the foundation of our beliefs. They realize it is the foundation of their belief. Without evolution, they can't believe it anymore. I can make another comment. Um, in the Bible, in Genesis 1 1, it says, In the beginning, God created him. Yeah? Which does not say necessarily when it was, could have been a million years ago, four billion. Uh, and then in verse 2, it says, And God's spirit went over the water. And then he started with creation. Now, when he created Adam, the devil, or Satan, was already fallen. How do you know? Well, he was Satan at the time. He was Satan at the time that he when? came to tempt Adam, but how long had Adam been there? We don't know. Okay, that's interesting. Okay. But, um, and Jesus said he saw Satan fall to earth uh, like lightning. Which might have happened before the creation, or you can say recreation. Some Bibles speak about recreation at the beginning. Not if there are direct translations of the Hebrew. So, so well, I'm not a, a scholar of Hebrew, but uh, so it could be, and it also specifies in, in Isaiah that uh, Satan was a ruler over nations, it's and so forth. Sorry? He still is. Fair enough. But on earth. So so you can argue that earth was there long ago. Uh, you, it was created in the beginning by God, whether that was four billion years ago or not, or whatever method God used. I'm not a, a, a evolution a theorist or whatever, but it could be that earth has been there for a long time. It was then destroyed, maybe with the fall of Satan or something or other, whatever. And then when Adam was created, Satan was, all, in, I mean, six days later, Satan was there already, Satan. So the argument, uh, you, you can argue that. Oh, you can argue. Unfortunately, I haven't got my Bible with me. Uh, it's a very interesting thing to do to go through Genesis chapter 1. Um, on his cell phone is what? Have you got? No. A genuine Bible. I've got an online version. What? A genuine one. Have you got a genuine Bible or a, a corruption <laughs> like <laughs> a message or a, a new international perversion uh, or something like that? I can tell you. Do you want the English one? Do you have an authorized? It's a. KJV complete. Um, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, I would suggest that that is a heading. Now, it may not be, but I'll give you my reasons for thinking it is shortly. But there are plenty of examples of, of things starting off with a heading. Um, the word there for 
heaven. It is the Hebrew word shamayim, which is in the dual, just as a pair of trousers or a pair of scissors in the dual. You have one thing with two aspects in that. So heaven is the word shamayim, and the earth ha'aretz. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And it's interesting that that immediately wipes out the Big Bang Theory. Because the first material that's mentioned here is water. The Big Bang requires the first thing that's produced is hydrogen. And this hydrogen has to collect into stars and you've got to have nuclear reactions going on which eventually build up oxygen and then when stars explode, those which become supernovas, you have these elements thrown about the universe and then at last now you can have hydrogen combining with oxygen and you can get water. Millions and millions of years after the Big Bang. So here we've got a direct refutation of the Big Bang Theory, because the first thing that's mentioned here is water. Sorry to, to interrupt, but the assumption that you are making is that that water was in a deformed Earth. But uh, it could be that the Earth was destroyed with water, again with water, the second time with, with no Well, water. let's carry on and see if that's okay. possible, OK? And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the day, the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Now you see this light that he creates, it's, there's no light bearer there. It doesn't say he created uh, a sun, or a star, or a flashlight. He creates light, but there's no light there. And this light defines time. Until that light is created, there is no definition of time. What happened had no measure. That measure is determined by the light. Now, what on earth that could be, is a difficult question because science can't tell us what light is. Science can tell us some things about what life does, but what life is, it's a mystery. There are some observations which can only be explained if light is some kind of a wave motion, waveform. But then, to be a waveform, it has to have a medium to travel through. And there are other observations which can only be explained if light is like a particle. So you've got a whole stack of experiments. Light has to be some kind of a wave. You've got a whole stack of experiments where it appears light has to be a quantum, some kind of a particle. And it doesn't help to try and combine them and say, well, light must be a wavicle, because there aren't any experiments which are explained by a wavicle. So what does this tell us? Well, we don't know what light is. So what this light was that God created, we don't know, but we do know that it defines time. Until this light was defined, there's no day, there's no night, there is no, there's no time measure. Now, it's hard to see how this can be, but the way I visualize it is this. If God created this light in some kind of a circuit and it takes one day to go around this circuit, we now have a definition where the light is, it's day, where it's not, it's night, and we have a definition of this time, day. So it's after he creates the light that he can say, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So how long he, he was hovering over the waters, it doesn't, it's not a meaningless, not a meaningful question. Because the measure, the means of measuring this light, this night and day, is only um, created 
and then one can talk about a day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. You'll notice we still only have one physical material, water. And he creates something else called the firmament. I don't think we're in a position yet to decide what that is, but it's somewhere in the midst of the waters, dividing <coughs> the waters below it from the waters above it. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. Now, it's interesting here, this, the firmament he makes on the second day, and that is this heaven, the word shamayim, the same one that we find in verse 1. So this is one of the reasons I think the first verse is a heading. In the beginning he made heaven and earth, and the heaven he made on the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. Now, here we've got something interesting. We've got water below, water above, the firmament in between, and in the water below, he says, let dry land appear. And the dry land does appear. And this reminds me of... Jesus' first miracle. What was the first thing Jesus did? He took water and he made something else from it. Wine in this case. And it looks here as if the original material is water and God creates land, dry land, out of the water and that fits in very well with 2 Peter chapter 3 where it says God created the earth out of the water and standing in the water whereby the world that then was, was overflowed. And it was so, and God called the dry land earth, Haaretz. That's also what we find in verse 1, God in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and here we have the heaven created on day 2, the earth created on day 3. Now, I may be wrong about that, but that's the way in reading it, I see it. And the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good, and God said, let the earth bring forth grass, and herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb, yielding seed after its kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after its kind, and God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. So by the end of the third day, we have got the waters below the firmament now transformed pretty well into the earth as we know it now. It's got land, it's got the sea, it's got trees, um, plants. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And to rule over the day and over the night. And to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So here we are. Now an indication of what this firmament is. It's the place where the sun, the moon, and the stars are. It's what we today would call space. So, we've got the waters below, turned in the earth much as we know it now, space, then the waters above, and now we've got the sun, the moon, and the stars, and they are for signs, for seasons, for days, and for years. Now, Days are defined by that light that God created on the first day. But it would appear to me from this that we cannot see that light. Maybe it is of a wavelength we are not sensitive to. Maybe it is outside the waters above and therefore is not visible for some reason. 
but it appears that the sun, the moon, and the stars are set there for a time measure that we can see. And presumably, they are in synchronous um, movement with the fundamental time-defining light that was created on the second day. So here we've got a huge problem for any idea about a destruction of, of the Earth before the first day. Because after, the, after that, in the beginning, all we've got is water. And it's not just that we've got an Earth that's covered with water, we've only got water. And the firmament is created in the midst of this water, and then in, in several places it says God created the firmament and stretched it out. So this firmament is surrounded by the water above, and the earth is only turned into the earth after this separation has taken place between the waters above by space, and then there is no sun, moon, star. So if there was any sort of existence before day four, it was entirely in the dark and could not have lasted very long. Now, he created the plants on the first day. It's quite possible for plants to go for a day with no light. It's not possible for plants to go much longer with no light. So we're not talking here about uh, some enormous period of time because those plants would not survive with no sun. Um, now, we're faced here with a cosmology which is utterly and completely different to the cosmology that the secular humanists put forward. It's completely different to the cosmology that we are taught in school, the cosmology we are brought up on. Utterly and completely different. We have got the Earth, we have got space around it with the sun, moon, and stars, and we've got the waters above. And what have we got above that? Well, the, I only find one place in the Bible where it tells us what's above. Because in Psalm 8, it says, God has set his glory above the heavens. And probably the reason why we can't see it is it's the other side of the waters above. Now, the waters above are only mentioned, as far as I can remember, in one other place. That's in Psalm 148, where it's calling upon the whole of creation to praise God. And it says, praise him, you heavens of heavens, praise him, you stars of light, and praise him, ye waters that be above the heavens. And we've had amazing proof that they're still here now. Because in, I suppose it would be in the 1970s, Penzias and Wilson, two very famous scientists, built a detector. And they wanted to scan the skies for microwave sources. They thought, well, there are X-ray sources, there are light sources, maybe there are microwave sources. So they built their antenna and pointed at the sky, hoping to find the two points where they got microwave uh, emissions. But to their surprise, they found everywhere they pointed this antenna, there was a uniform microwave emission at just over two degrees absolute. That's extremely cold. Minus 270 degrees. Everywhere. And they were amazed. They said, well, what can this be? How on earth can there be this uniform background and everywhere the same temperature? Now, obviously, they have found the waters above. They found this water is uniform. It's at a uniform temperature now. At only two degrees absolute, it's probably frozen solid. But there it is. But what did the scientific establishment say? They said, oh my, what can this be? Oh yes, 
this must be the echo of the Big Bang. Now, did you know that an explosion could leave an echo two degrees above absolute zero everywhere, totally uniform? Well, this idea is very popular, but there's, there are enormous problems for it. They've tried to fit this into the Big Bang story, but the problem is the universe is full of galaxies and stars and things which are not uniform at all. And if there were such a thing as an echo from the Big Bang, it would not be uniform at all. It would have the imprint of stars and galaxies on it. So it's very obvious what it is. It's the waters above. But you won't find the scientific community accepting that. They will, they will carry on with fairy stories like echoes of Big Bang. But it's there. So this, this whole cosmology does, simply does not allow for, for this, this story. You, know, you don't have an Earth with anything like the right sort of characteristics to be considered the Earth until day three. There's no life on it until day four. There isn't even a mass of water separated from the rest which can become the Earth until day two. Until day two, it's all one mass with the waters above. There's no chance for this story of a, a pre-day one disaster. There are also incidents in America. Can you say something about it? There are also incidents. Is it a fairy tale or is it something? Is it a big hoax? Why is it really? I don't know what the Roswell incident is about, but I do know that the people who were mainly involved in the, the hoo-ha about it have been very largely discredited. They have very largely been shown to be people who had an interest in a dramatic story for, for personal gain, the evidence seems fairly clear that the actual problem was a weather balloon which got damaged and came down. And the remains of this so-called spaceship, the evidence seems to be pretty convincing that it was a weather balloon. I'm not an expert. What I have found is that in most of the cases of extraterrestrial contacts, they almost all involve either people who are involved in witchcraft or people who are involved in hallucinatory drugs. And the two go hand in hand. Hallucinatory drugs and witchcraft go hand in hand. Um, so I would say that that kind of thing is very likely concerned with the dubious spiritual beings. You know, there is no doubt whatsoever that people in witchcraft really do have a very strong connection with um, powerful spiritual beings and they can make apparitions um, but it's stuff that I would not want to have anything to do with. Uh, I don't play with spiritual powers unless I'm led there. You know, if one is if one is faced with the problem of, of dealing with someone who's got spiritual problems, then you can't run away from it. But to go and play, um, uh, you're not likely to end up like the seven sons of Skeva. <laughs> <laughs> being hammered, unless the Lord sends you there, stay clear. Now, I've found this attitude um, not very prevalent among Christians. I remember when I got saved, I was an atheist, I got saved and I joined a fairly typical Pentecostal church, and the attitude where, where there was, Satan's nothing, he's a zero with the ring knocked on. 
well, that was popping. But uh, in such circles, I never actually came across, across people who had any spiritual authority. Now, when I did go to a place where there were people with spiritual authority, I went for a drive with someone who I realized was a very spiritually strong person. And we came to a beautiful wood. This was in the town. And I said, my, can we stop and have a walk in the wood? He said, no. This wood is the domain of a very powerful witch. And you don't go in there. And I thought, Satan's a zero with the ring knocked, knocked off. Why should anybody be concerned about going in there just because there's a witch in charge of it? <laughs> but you know, I have seen that man bring witches to repentance. When God tells him to go and deal with, with witchcraft, he'll go. But until God tells him, he stays clear. Perhaps since we are talking about what is science, just to um, get some clarity, uh, the the atheists, um, guys, I get to do with online and so forth. But in general, the viewpoint, um, they like to tackle the thing that um, the people who believe in creation science, uh, they are phonies. They don't have any degrees and so forth. While as the clever people in the world, of all the PhDs and stuff. They are, they are the guys that say, but evolution, Big Bang, all these things are true. And uh, so the question I have is, number one, um, for general people like us, do you have to have uh, credentials, a PhD and so forth, to uh, be able to concoct a fairy tales, <laughs> or to be, um, to be a valid uh, voice out there? Number one, so do you have to be able to have a valid voice, the credentials, to, so somebody can listen to you? Because as I understand, Darwin was not a, a scientist by, by credentials. Um, and secondly, um, uh, I know there are many uh, scientists with PhDs and so forth that does believe in creation science. Um, so number one, does it matter if, the, does the credentials really play that big a part? Or can an ordinary guy uh, be clever about it? and have a voice, and number two, um, are there people out there that are clever, that do have the PhDs, that say, but no, um, this uh, real science says, uh, is in line with what the Bible says. Like you said, maybe it does not prove there is a God, but it does definitely not contradict it. Um, I don't know if my question is clear. Yeah. Look, this idea that you have to be, uh, you have to have established credentials to be able to make a statement is recent. And it's all part of the control that is, they want to exercise over science. This wasn't the case before. When I, um, when I studied geology, for example, just about the highest authority one could look to was Arthur Holmes. Arthur Holmes had an MA. Full stop, Master of Arts. So this whole idea that you've got to be, um, you've got to have top qualifications from the scientific establishment, it's recent. Charles Lyell, the founder, one could say, of modern geology. The whole of geology is built on him. His only qualifications were in law. Charles Darwin, his only qualifications were in theology. There's a very interesting man called Barry Setterfield. I don't know if you've heard of him, he's an Australian. A very intelligent man. And he was at Adelaide University studying physics and geology. And uh, the Lord spoke to him and said, you're prepared to put all this work in for a degree. Are you prepared to do this work for me? He left the university, he studied entirely on his own, he has no qualifications at all, and yet he's one of the most brilliant scientists around. 
it was thanks to him that I got into this kind of thing. This was a deliberate, a deliberate choice to be a nothing and a nobody. Because the Bible says God uses those who are small in the eyes of the world. If you're a nothing and a nobody, God can use you. If you're something special, well, you can look after yourself, but God won't use you. God uses the despised of this world. And that's... Barry Setterfield is quite happy to be despised by this world, but used by God. As far as I'm concerned, a PhD in science today means that you conform to what you are told to say. You conform to what you are told to believe. About two or three years ago, I came across the story of a, um, a woman at American University who was doing a PhD on mice. And after about three years' research, she went to her supervisor and said, well, look, it's very clear from my research that mice cannot evolve and have not evolved. And he said to her, well, you either show that they did evolve or you get no PhD. What he's saying is you falsify your observations to fit in with what I want or else you don't get no PhD. So what is the meaning of a PhD? It means you are prepared to conform to what the establishment requires. Thank you.